meet you face to face yet. <laughs> um, it's 12.01, so I think uh, we can go ahead and let me introduce today's uh, seminar of the Institute of Cosmos Sciences. So we're really very happy today that, uh, that we have Ruxandra Bondarescu uh, for this uh, seminar. And uh, so Ruxandra, uh, she, um, she was, uh, she started uh, in, in her research uh, uh, when she did her, her PhD thesis at uh, Cornell University. Uh, at Cornell, she worked on neutron stars, and then uh, she went uh, ahead and did uh, postdoc positions at Penn State University and at the Physics Institute at the University of Zurich. Uh, today, Rosandra Bondarescu is at the Portsmouth at the Institute of Cosmology and Gravitation, and she is an expert on uh, various topics: uh, neutron stars, uh, gravitational wave detectors, and uh, gravitational waves in general. Uh, various detectors, like uh, also some uh, spacecraft uh, ranging measures and, uh, uh, you know, having clocks on board spacecraft, atomic clocks technology. She has also worked on applications of uh, gravitational wave detectors for um, Earth geophysics, and she has been a, a LIGO member for several years. Um, and uh, in addition to all this uh, research, uh, Ruxandra also uh, okay. has done a a lot of dissemination in no, science, too, both general and uh, and also she has some very interesting children's books. Uh, if if someone is interested, uh, that's also something important for scientists to do. Okay, so uh, um, I will just uh, let you start, Ruxandra, with your talk today about uh, gravitational waves. And thank you very much for agreeing to this seminar. Okay, so this is my first actually talk via Zoom, other than when I help my children do it. <laughs> so um, I, I hope to manage it. So I'm going to share my screen, right? Yes, please. Uh, so that you can see my slides. Um, but then I'm not going to see you, you'll just see my slides. So if anybody has anything to say, I suppose I'll hear. Um, no, I also see you. Okay, um, great, thank you. Thank you. So um, you should also have the link to the slides in the email if somehow the connection is too slow. Um, so I will talk about um, the importance of general relativity in everyday life, which is kind of an unusual way to think of general relativity. We're getting to the point where uh, we can use it as a tool to learn about the universe with LIGO. And um, in other precision measurements, when you have atomic clocks, you can use it as a tool to learn about underground structure um, and about the solar system. Okay. Um, so the first manifestation of general relativity and the most obvious one is gravity. It's the manifestation of the curvature of space-time. And when the curvature is weak, you get the usual Newtonian gravity. So nothing unusual here. Um, and how do we use these precision measurements? Well, whenever you define any kind of unit, you're actually talking about atomic time. So we're talking about the second. Since 19, 1967, the second is, has been defined as a, as in terms of transitions between two hyperfine levels of cesium and has been improving with microwave atomic clocks. And the meter is defined by fixing the speed of light and is defined by the path that life traveled in vacuum in the interval of one over the speed of light. Uh, so we are better at measuring time than at measuring anything else. And as atomic clocks improve, our ability to measure these units also change. And the kilogram is no longer a block somewhere in Paris um, since 2019, but it's actually defined by fixing the Planck constant. And again, we define it in terms of atomic time. And the advantage of having these units, these basic units that we use in our everyday life, defined in terms of atomic time is that they improve instead of getting worse. So the, the, the block in Paris was losing weight just by sitting there. Whereas atomic clocks get better as we find new methods of counting them and, and the, the units improve. Okay. How about LIGO? 
LIGO is, is impressive in its own way because it measures um, the arm lengths, which are four kilometers in size, which is the distance you walk about in about an hour, to a precision of a thousand of the size of the proton to 10 to the minus 18 meters. This is what we need to do to find gravitational waves, and we can do this. This is not science fiction. Okay, so gravitational waves are something like uh, electromagnetic waves, only instead of being produced by, uh, by accelerated charges, they are produced by accelerated masses. And they are vibrations of the space-time itself, which means that they are not affected by intervening stuff between us and the event that was billions of years ago. Okay, so, and in terms of frequencies, gravitational waves are more like sound waves. Their range is like 10 to a minus 9 hertz to 10 to a 4 hertz whereas light waves have higher frequencies. The primary thing that limits us in LIGO is the noise. You have, right now you have two kinds of noise in LIGO, seismic noise and short noise. Seismic noise is in the low frequency band and short noise is in the high frequency band. So, um, Seismic noise can mean also it's not just earthquake. It can mean that there is local traffic, uh, that a car has passed by, a motorcycle, somebody has closed the door in the detector room. All of this is seen in the low frequency band. And the photon short noise is how we count uh, the photons and it gets lower if, for example, we increase the, the power in the laser. Also is squeezing, quantum squeezing. And in advanced detectors, we expect that the photon short, short noise will become subdominant, that will manage to do the squeezing better and increase the power of the laser. And then the, thor the thermal noise will be dominant. So the thermal noise um, is noise because, of the, because the mirrors are imperfect. So they have bumps and valleys. And for example, if you average, if you, if you build a wider beam and you average over more of the mirror, then you can lower the thermal noise. And the thermal noise will be in the, so, in the sweet spot of LIGO, in the, in the best sensitivity area of LIGO. Um, I've done some work on that in 2008 where we looked at um, widening the mirror while keeping the diffraction loss constant. And we, we saw that final mirror effects, mirror effects can be important if you get some, some unexpected resonances. Yes, yes. Um, Okay, but what, do we, what did we expect to see? So LIGO has been around since 2001, and it's been taking data since then. And while the detection was in 2015, um, it was always the principle was that it would, you know, we were hoping it would happen any time since it started running. Uh, but of course, the estimates show that this was the time when it more or less should have happened. Uh, but the primary sources, so what did we expect to see with LIGO? We expected to see binary neutron stars, okay? Why? Because we've already seen them in the galaxy. They were not quite merging, but um, we, we knew that they existed. And then the next potential source were binary black holes. Um, whenever we did inject injection, injections, we do binary black hole injections because they were simpler. It was a simpler waveform. <laughs> uh, but we, we, we actually expected to see binary neutron stars first or a combination of black holes and neutron stars, but that, again, that's a more rare event. Um, okay, so why did we, why did we expect to set binary neutron stars? Because we knew uh, that this is how it was proven that the gravitational wave existed through the Hulse-Taylor binary, which won the Nobel Prize in 1993. Um, um, uh, where the data of the, of the decrease in the orbital separation due to loss of energy in gravitational waves rarely matched the, the, the general relativity prediction. So this was the proof that gravitational wave existed. Okay, but there are other sources of gravitational waves that we haven't seen yet. For example, core corrupt supernovas. These have a messy waveform so there are no templates, we have to do unmodeled searches for this. And then there are continuous waves. 
uh, like pulsars, pulsars with a, with a mountain on them, or pulsars with an unstable mode, which also could emit gravitational waves. Um, these are mostly galactic sources or, you know, 100 kiloparsecs, this sort of stuff. So both the core core of supernova and pulsars have to be closer to be seen. But we've seen many of them electromagnetically, so maybe, you know, we'll see them in the gravitational wave spectrum as well. And the other uh, kind of noise, uh, the other kind of source that LIGO could have has stochastic sources. So one of them is a jumble of signals that we can't resolve yet. That, that would be a stochastic source. So for example, right now we see one black hole binary a week. Well, LIGO is running now, it's not operational because of COVID-19. Um, but if you extrapolate, if you increase the volume of what we see today to the observable universe, um, you get, you get one gravitational wave every 15 minutes. That's the best, the, the most perfect gravitational wave that they could in principle do. And all those weak signals could merge into, merge into a kind of noise. Um, and also the stochastic noise can come from example for gravitational waves from the inflation, from inflation. Okay. So these are the sources of gravitational waves. Then um, the next slide, which is slide 13, is uh, just showing the kind of detectors that we will have. So LIGO is in the high frequency band. And then LISA, if it's going to be launched in 2034, will be sensitive to even more massive binaries. And it will reach lo a lower frequency band. And pulsars, um, the timing of pulsars, um, which reaches even lower frequencies, even more massive binaries, black holes, supermassive black holes, like the ones at the galactic center. Uh, um, so, and if you have new a bunch of new detectors that are proposed for in between, so for example, if you have clocks in, in space, uh, you'd, you'd, you'd reach a band in between Lisa and Pulsar timing through space of Doppler tracking, basically. Um, Whereas if you put the Einstein telescope on the moon, you could reach something between LISA and um, compact binary uh, and LIGO. But eventually we hope to map the whole gravitational wave sky uh, with some kind of detector. Okay, the next slide is a picture of the various LIGO sites. Everybody seems to have it in the talk. The prettiest one is Virgo because it's green. <laughs> Okay, uh, which is in Italy, and then you have Hanford in the desert and um, the Livingstone LIGO in the Louisiana swamps where they actually have life going on it. So during the day, the signal can be very messy due to the traffic on the highway. And they also had alligators. So when I went to LIGO in 2003 to teach the first gravitational waves course there with my brother, uh, they had this alligator which LIGO had received as a pet and they were getting rid of it because it, was start, it started to run after LIGO employees and it was trying to get food. But, they, you know, somebody who has an alligator running after them is not so certain that <laughs> what kind of food it wants. Okay, so um, we, this was soon after LIGO started to take meaningful data. I think it was S1. Um, and um, my brother read, recorded these lectures of Kip Tones on gravitational waves. They were the first lectures on gravitational waves in the world. And they wanted to make movie quality uh, lectures that would be available for many years to come. And they're still available on YouTube. And then Kip moved on to, to do Interstellar with Steven Spielberg. And um, he started soon after we finished the uh, gravitational wave lectures with people in the classrooms, <laughs> which we tried to make Hollywood quality. And then he went to Hollywood and he proposed this trip. And it took more than 10 years to actually make the movie and get it. Um, uh, get Michael Caine to, to play Kip Thorne and Anne Hathaway and all the other people to play um, the various other characters in the movie. And um, on the next slide, you can see Kip in his office at Caltech explaining to the actress that plays the daughter, uh, explaining physics on the blackboard. Um, okay, so what's the big deal about gravitational waves? Okay, what, 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 what do we want to do with them? Okay, well, uh, 
Don Ramsfeld used to say that there are known knowns and there are known unknowns, but there are also unknown unknowns. So, so far with LIGO, and I'm going to talk a bit about the just effects. Cosas, muchas cosas. Go ahead. What? I can't hear. Uh, can you say this again? Do you actually no, hear me? Or sorry, there seems to be some background noise, but I don't know where it comes from. There is some other. Uh, it's not among the list of speakers, but I can't see where it is. Jairo Martinez, I don't know where this noise comes from. Uh, maybe in the yak they could do something because there's also like some so sound of running water and I cannot identify what the problem is. It's it just not. Okay, seems to have disappeared, so let's go on. So, sorry, Rosandra. Yeah, um, uh, maybe it's yeah. coming from. I, I, I do, my house is near, near the street, so maybe cars going by. Okay. Um, um, there's no running water. <laughs> Is it me making the no no? Mm -hmm. um, so pl please just go ahead because uh, it seems to have gone away mostly now. So let, let's let's continue. Yeah, I went. I live next to a big road, and eventually, you know, there are trucks going by on the. Um, okay, so who was Don Ransfeld? Don Ransfeld was actually the Secretary of Defense during the Bush, Bush administration when I was when we were teaching gravitational waves at LSU. He was responsible for the Iraq war. Um, so, and that's probably the deaths of many people, but he also has this brilliant, brilliant quote, which we can use in LIGO. But the point is that we have seen what we expected to see and a bunch of new sources that we didn't expect to see, some classes of new objects. And um, now, you know, it would be really exciting to see some unknown unknowns, some, some unknown sources, something that, you know, we didn't know existed. But you know, it remains to be seen what LIGO sees in the next observing lands. Okay, so again, we're expecting to see neutron star binaries and we're expecting to see black hole binaries, but smaller mass than what we actually seen because in X rays, uh, black holes were perhaps 10 solar masses, but the higher the mass, the larger the error bars on the mass. So they didn't know um, you could have 20 or 30 solar mass black holes. We didn't know that such objects existed. And the neutron stars, we've seen 17 galactic neutron stars, but all of them had these masses around, so if you look at slide 19, the middle is the neutron star binaries masses. So most of them are around 1.4 solar masses. And the ones that are smaller or bigger, again, have very, very large error bars. Okay, so we expected that you see neutron stars with a mass of around 1.4 solar mass. And, and lighter black holes than what we actually see. Then the next slide, slide 20, is um, what, the, what the first observing ground saw, and it saw black holes, more massive than we thought existed, of 30, 40 solar masses was the first detection. Um, and then there were two others that were also black hole binaries. And then um, the next slide is O1 plus O2, so again, Black hole binaries, more, more within the, most within the 20 to 40 solar mass range, and one neutron star binary. These, these were the first two observing around 10 black hole binaries and one neutron star binary. Then how far were we able to go? Well, up to about 3 billion light years from Earth. So this means that the gravitational waves were emitted 3 billion years ago, and they go to Earth now. Um, so what did we learn from these 10 black hole mergers that we saw? Most of them were equal mass. They had this higher mass than we expected, and they had no spin, which means that they were likely born this way, not from prior mergers, because it's hard for black holes to get rid of the spin. Um, and that they were most likely field binaries, which means that they formed from stars, from supernova collapse. And in general, when stars, stars form, they form in binaries just because of the way that this fragment and makes the black holes more likely to be born with close to equal masses and no spin. Okay, um, there is an alternative theory that somehow they were born in a dense environment and that uh, you'd have uh, three body interactions where the lighter object was kicked out, but um, 
then they are more likely to have random spins. And right now, the, 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 we, we've seen no spin. And they are consistent with no, the data is consistent with no spin in the one and no two searches. Okay, what about the next search? So in the next search in O3, they started to see some more, what, some more rare events. Okay, so they've seen in, in, in April 2019, they've seen an anipole mass object. So one of the black holes was eight solar masses and the other was 30 solar masses. And this means that you see more than one gravitational wave frequency. So you see the higher order multiforms, multiples. And also the larger black hole had spin. So it's likely formed from the merger of two smaller ones. But since we don't have any kind of electromagnetic signature, we don't know which galaxy it is from, so it's hard to draw conclusions about the kind of environment it formed in since you don't know where it actually is. Okay. Then another very interesting object that they saw in this last run, which was actually 56 um, events, so a lot more than in the pre previous two runs, one, one, the one week sort of run. Um, so they've seen an object in the mass gap where we haven't detected up to now either black hole or neutron star. So one of the objects had 2.6 solar masses and the other 23 solar masses. This is the most unequal mass measurement in gravitational waves. Um, and it's a question that we don't know what this 2.6 solar mass object is. Did it form from the merger of two neutron stars? It is a very heavy neutron star, which um, it's a bit unlikely because uh, due to stars are believed to be unstable above 2.2 solar masses. But then if it's a black hole, then um, again, black holes are believed to be heavier. So we don't know what this object actually is. It could come from the merger of two neutron stars, be some kind of hypermassive neutron star. Um, we haven't seen anything like it before. Okay. And then my favorite candidate is, this is the only candidate in, in the Austrian run that had um, an electromagnetic signature. Um, this is a high, uh, the most, ma uh, uh, the, the, the very massive black hole, the major between a very massive black hole. With the, the LIGO paper, it is, it's a candidate because the LIGO paper isn't out yet for the others, LIGO published individual papers. So for this one, they haven't yet. However, there is a paper from the astrophysics community that suggests that the black hole was kicked, the final black hole was kicked from the merger. Uh, and it, it's, it's near a quasar, so it was kicked to the accretion disk of the quasar and produced light. And we will check this hypothesis perhaps in November, in 1.6 years after the merger, which happened in May 2019, um, if the black hole then encounters the accretion disk, there should be another flare. Um, so it would be very, it would be the first black hole binary that's coincident with an electromagnetic emission. And this is because quasars have a large disk around them and um, as the black hole goes very fast through the disk to produce light. We've seen these sort of kicks in numerical relativity and really cool to see them in sort of real life. Okay, now getting back to the other <laughs> event to neutron star mergers. So the first uh, electromagnetic um, detection um, that we've, saw, we've seen also with LIGO was the, the first neutron star merger. Um, and what's interesting about this is that they were able to localize it to, to tell which, exactly which galaxy it came from so we know it came from NGC 4993, okay? Um, this is a, a, a galaxy that um, has an old stellar population, so that's a bit unusual. Um, and this event also generated a new type of source, so the Kironova source. So now astronomers can look back at X-ray data and find similar events. There are two candidates that could also be neutron star binaries that were not seen um, in the um, um, gravitational wave spectrum. Um, and the other interesting thing they saw is that they saw the cloud of neutrons, the neutron-rich material, um, and they also saw that neutron stars produce heavy elements, neutron star collisions produce heavy elements like strontium, gold, platinum, ytterbium, all these things that we make clocks out of, or 
you know, jewelry are produced in Newton star mergers. Um, the, the, the question about having it in an old stellar population is that we haven't seen such neutron stars in all stellar populations before. So the question is, how are they formed? How? Uh, otherwise, the, the neutron stars are fairly common. They each one from four solar mass roughly to work together. It's 2.8 solar, 2.82 solar masses together. Um, okay. But then the second neutron star merges that LIGO has seen in this latest run, they had much larger, they had a larger total mass. But because it was the one detector event, we couldn't localize it well in gravitational waves. Um, so that means that um, we couldn't really find it in electromagnetic data either. So we don't know much about, we, we, all, we know the total masses, we have the waveforms, we don't know anything about the stellar environment or which galaxies come from. So that's what it's like. so it would be really interesting to have more such detectors, especially borderline detectors that they wouldn't see with electromagnetic signatures, um, with, through, just through their electromagnetic signals that we could trigger and have them find them because of LIGO. Okay, so why, why would neutron stars be so heavy? This slide 29. Uh, well, they could be born in a low metallicity environment, which means that they could be born in tight orbits that could evade the electromagnetic detection. It is a population that has not been seen before. Um, or uh, they could be born in a dense environment where a companion is swapped for a heavier neutron star. Or it could be that one is a very light black hole, but then we don't know how such a light black hole would, would form. Okay, and until we know more about, uh, until we have more events, it's hard to begin to, to see which scenario is true. Um, again, as more events come through, we expect to understand the details of the merger. So for example, um, do the tidal modes excite um, um, internal modes in the stars that cause the crust to shatter? If they do, they could generate a precursor that is separate from the um, merger event and it's isotropic. This is the next slide, slide 30. Then some work on this earlier, um, 2012. And I guess the, the beauty of this precursor is that it's isotropic, so it doesn't have to be beamed towards Earth to, so to, to see it. So um, in some cases, you might see the precursor um, if it's a, um, but again, we're waiting for better data to see these sort of smaller or closer events, <laughs> um, uh, this kind of detail. And the other question is, why don't objects have spin? Okay, why don't neutron stars have spin? And one, one method to spin neutron stars down would be to have a kind of instability like the R mode instability, which is R, R stands for rotational instability or Rossby weight instability, which means it doesn't exist if the star do, doesn't rotate. So the R mode instability is a kind of instability where um, it grows as gravitational radiation is emitted. And there is a competition between the gravitational radiation term and the viscosity, which um, slows the instability down. So as long as the gravitational reaction term is bigger than viscosity, then you have, you have this instability. And you can spin down newborn neutron stars that, are, that, could be, that would be born at kilohertz frequencies, or you can spin down accreting neutron stars um, and create a kind of, uh, and make it unlikely for them to be this is slide 32, to be, to be, to spin above 600 hertz or so. Um, basically, there is no physical reason why we shouldn't see fast accretors unless there is some kind of instability that um, precludes them from spinning fast. Okay. Um, and the animals are such a instability that could could explain why we don't see fast rotators uh, among young pulsars and we don't see, it, it, took, it, took, it takes us a very long time to find a, a fast rotator. So the first millisecond pulsar ever found span at six, 642 hertz. 
And then the next faster pulsar was found 24 years later um, and spins at 716 hertz. And we haven't found anything that's faster than that. So there is a question, since there is no selection effect in the instrument, why aren't pulsars spinning at one kilohertz or faster? There must be something that slows them down. And perhaps with LIGO, we could see if such an instability exists, if we see it in the galaxy. Um, okay. Now next is what we want to see is some kind of object that we haven't seen with anything else. So some kind of unknown, unknown as Don Lansford used to say. So the simplest object would be a kind of dark matter star, like a boson star or a soliton star, which is formed from fundamental, uh, from spin zero particles, like the Higgs, if it's from a complex field, if it's a boson star, or um, from axions, if it's a soliton star, real, some kind of real field configuration. These kinds of stars are interesting because they're supported against collapse by Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. They are relatively easy to solve for numerically. They are solutions of the einstein klein gordon equation. Um, and um, they, are, they are smooth, so unlike neutron stars, there's no, there are no shocks. So they used to be, there used to be waveforms from this before they had waveforms from neutron star binaries. Um, the, the field tails off exponentially and it, the radius of the star is defined where 95% or 99% of the mass is present depending on which paper you read. Um, but the fact that the field tails off exponentially, exponentially it means physically that we have, there is some probability of finding some kind of boson of any radius. Um, so what kind of masses would we see for these dark matter particles? We haven't seen such particles yet. Uh, but if they are out there, you could see with LIGO, you could see bosons of 10 to the minus 10, 10 to 10 to the minus 12 EV, so some kind of very light dark matter particles. Um, so for example, if the particle is 10 to the minus 10 EV, then the radius of the boson star would be 10 kilometer, where the radius of the black hole of the same mass would be three kilometer, three kilometer, which is for a solar mass type object, okay? Um, then you could also have um, some kind of wig or, or cloud around regular st around neutron stars or around black holes made from dark matter that makes them heavier than you'd expect. So the question is, you know, do we just have visible matter out there, or is there a way to naturally mix visible and dark matter, which makes these black holes and neutron stars heavier than you'd expect otherwise? And we don't know the answer to this question. Um, the next slide, I, slide 36, I have a waveform that I produced recently. I've done simulations of, of soliton stars and boson stars in the past uh, before I finish my PhD. Um, so if you have a small perturbation, basically the star rings in, in its quasi-normal mode, you can solve the einstein clay gordon equation it is a single perturb boson star. Um, whereas if the perturbation is larger, the next slide, then the waveform is more complicated. Um, but I haven't done a complete study yet. Um, but uh, what, um, okay, so, uh, basically the difference between uh, this kind of boson stars and, um, and uh, regular black holes and neutron stars is that you can get a more complicated dynamics. You can have the stars go through each other um, because the anchor momentum is, con is conserved. They could repel each other. Um, they could go through each, through each other a few times before merging. And also, because the field extends to infinity, you have more mass loss, more tidal deformation and uh, potentially um, modes with higher imaginary parts or a richer um, spectrum of modes as well. But right now with LIGO observations, we don't really measure tidal deformations well, we don't measure rig down well. So this will all change in the, in the next months where we can actually say whether such objects exist or not. Um, okay. So as we get more and more gravitational wave data, we want to be able to 
uh, make the most of it. So we, have, we really have to understand well what, what LIGO sees and what are the limitations. Are the limitations coming from the instrument? Are the limitations coming from our models? So right now, in terms of black hole binaries, we've seen 20 to 40 solar mass black holes. Okay. Um, and we, as tidal deformations and ring down measurements um, can be done better, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll learn more about these events. Um, in neutron star, the, the black hole simulations, if it's just black holes with no matter, the simulations are relatively simple and we can do them precisely and we can have very good waveforms. But when matter is added, things become complicated. Um, and in neutron star binaries, you have additional complications because right now we, we use polytropic models in all our simulations. Um, but the matter is not actually expected to be in equilibrium. The equilibrium time scale is much longer than the merger time scale. So it, it wouldn't really be a polytrope. So um, the question is how do you model it uh, to make it more general and how much the equation of state matters. Again, all those assume equilibrium conditions which are not there in do you get kicks? Um, do you get these kind of unstable modes that, that ring in with the tidal modes and shatter the crust? Um, there are a lot of uh, interesting questions we could answer if we had this data from tides and ring down. And right now it's, it's there, but we don't, we have very large error bars, so it's, we put it down, it's, it's difficult to use. Um, do we see black hole neutron star mergers? Well, if we did, then it's unlikely that we'd see the merger itself, we would just see the ring down. Again, here it would be really helpful to see the tidal deformation, the mass loads, um, and we don't really know whether we see black holes or boson stars or some other kind of exotic objects, um, but we will very soon. They are probably black holes, but perhaps they aren't. <laughs> uh, they are heavier than, 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 than we, we, we saw they'd be, and we don't know why. Okay. So now I have... Um, yeah, so what's, what's really a question is, does dark matter mix with visible matter and how well does it do the mixing? Um, do we really just have visible matter stars or are there a mixture between dark and visible matter? Do they have large disks of dark matter or halos or wings or clouds or however you want to call them? Um, and that's something we might be able to tell from live observations as we get more precision. That's a very important question uh, in terms of astrophysics and cosmology too. Um, so it's a question of where do the particles come from. Okay, now if we have another, I have a few slides of, about clocks at the top. I don't know how much time I have left. It's, um, you have about 15 minutes, uh, Roxanne, yeah. and it would be good to have some time for questions. Uh, yeah. By the time, let me just say now, if anybody has questions, you can also write them in the chat and then we'll... Yes, go ahead, yeah, write them in the chat if you have questions. Uh, that way they'll, we'll, we'll record them. <laughs> and I can, even if I cannot answer them now properly, I can get back to you later. Um, but yes, um, so I just have a few slides about clocks. So, um, Atomic clocks are becoming more and more accurate. We have clocks on the GPS that um, measure time. Um, they have an, a, a frequency accuracy of about 10 to the minus 12 at one second. Um, these are microwave clocks. Okay, well, whereas optical clocks are, are clocks that use transitions in the visible spectrum. That are about, about a factor of 10 to the five times better than, than microwave clocks. So instead of having a, a, an accuracy of 10 to the minus 12 of one second, the best optical clocks today get an accuracy of 10 to the minus 17 at one second. Okay, which is really amazing. And we have them on Earth. Um, um, the, the, Microwave technology is present in most technology out there. Okay, but the problem is that, it, is that it's reaching the noise floor at around 10 to the minus 16. So if you look at slide 41, um, microwave clocks have improved a factor of 10 every decade since the Second World War. But right now the improvement has, has flattened out at around 10 to the minus 16 as they reach the noise floor. 
whereas optical clocks are still improving by a few orders of magnitude over the decade. Um, and um, so we have these clocks that have a, have a stability of accuracy of 10 to the minus 18, 10 to the minus 19 level on Earth. And what's new this year is that they're able to um, combine microwave and optical clocks for the first time. So before, optical clocks could only be compared and talked to each other. Now they build um, down conversions between optical and microwave clocks. So you can use the optical clock as a standard to make the microwave clocks better. And you can use, basically you, you start to be able to use, most electronics have micro, are built to use microwave technology. So you're starting to be able, you, you are able to use this increased precision from, from, orbit, from optical clocks, which in the past was just a, a thing that was done in the laboratory. It wasn't used for practical applications. Uh, practical applications were just in theory. So now practical applications are becoming a real possibility. Okay. Um, and they also have port, they, they build the first portable clocks that have stability at accuracies at 10 to the minus 18 level, which means they can make equivalent height measurements of one centimeter. So in the past, um, there was, um, you could put a, a clock at the bottom and the top of a champagne bottle, say 30 centimeters, and you'd see that the clock at the top was slightly uh, faster than the clock at the bottom. This is time dilation. Um, and they were able to measure this in 2010 with atomic clocks, with optical atomic clocks. Now they can measure equivalent height of one centimeter since 2020, 10 years later. Uh, so that means that you can have a clock at the top of your uh, uh, eraser <laughs> and at the bottom of your eraser, and you can see that the top clock at the top is slightly faster than the clock at the bottom, at the bottom due to the presence of the Earth. Also, uh, you could, you, your, your feet are slightly, um, uh, slightly younger than your head. And we can measure this sort of the time difference. Okay, so in terms of applications, what can you do with this, with this sort of equivalent car height of one centimeter level? Uh, well, that means you're sensitive to objects that are about one kilometer underground shift that are, that, um, and that, that means lots of um, events in terms of geophysics, oil, water, better mapping of underground structures, uh, seismic dike intrusions. intrusions. So um, one centimeter is, is equivalent height and better will be very useful in terms of applications on us. Okay, and the primary thing that you can do with such clocks is that you could measure the geoid. The geoid is, accounts for all effects of all kinds all, all kind of subsurface density variations. So it's the surface where the potential doesn't change. So it's fairly easy to measure on the sea level uh, and harder to measure on continent. And in terms of clock language, it's the, the surface on which the tick rate of the clock is constant. Um, and because clocks are sensitive directly to, 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 to potential differences, they offer a more direct measurement um, of what's underground than, say, gravimeters, which measure a vector. Um, because the vector has both an amplitude and a direction, and it's hard to measure both accurately. Usually they can get the amplitude very accurately, but they can't get the direction. Whereas if you measure potential differences, you don't have this sort of problem. Um, but of course, you want to combine the different methods. So you can combine um, um, clock measurements uh, with, at least, for example, gravimeter measurements. And if you look at just the simple example of a sphere underground, if you do that, uh, and all your unknowns are the depths and the radius and density constants, then you can find, for example, the distance to your sphere. Okay, so it means that you can reduce the uncertainty of the inverse problem. Now, in reality, you have a lot more uncertainty than that. So, um, but uh, in principle, as portable clocks become usable on a larger scale, you could see uh, your clock beating faster as you go over a natural gas or oil deposit because oil is lighter than magma or in soil. Okay? Um, uh, similarly, if you're on top of a volcano, of a volcano, and you have a clock, and you compare it with a reference clock, 
if there is magma moving underground, um, you might see your clock slowing down before the ground shifts. This is particularly useful for super volcanoes where you have a lot of magma and we don't understand what's happening underground, like Yellowstone, and it could in principle blow up any time uh, now. Um, so, um, and another very useful application is actually understanding where the water is. So the sweet water that we actually see and use in rivers and lakes is about 2% of the fresh water. 90% is in aquifers underground. And we don't know how depleted these aquifers are um, and how much they go down or up because we don't monitor them. So again, as you have more, more of this very precise optical clocks around, um, you could monitor um, the aquifers and see what, what's going on with the water. And another thing that you can do is monitor the atheistic effects um, around planets. So as you do better and better spacecraft tracking, um, you can measure frame dragging around Jupiter and Saturn. Um, it turns out that um, with Juno already, you could resolve frame dragging around Jupiter. Um, the Juno, Juno should resolve velocity changes of micrometers per second, um, and the frame dragging effect is around 10 to the minus 13, so it's an order of magnitude above what Juno can resolve in, resolve in principle. Um, uh, what's interesting about planets is that they are not exactly curved black holes, which means that their spin is of the order of thousands or hundreds. And for gas giants like Jupiter, Saturn, well, for Jupiter we know the spin field, but Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, we don't know. We have, you have large brain dragging, but you don't know um, the spin period, you don't know what's happening inside the planet. You don't know if you have a solid core, how large the core is, um, the uncertainty is the moment of inertia and in the spin period. So the frame dragging is an, is an additional measurement that could be used to understand the interior of the planet better. Because it constrains the spin. Um, okay, so why are clocks important? Um, they are the most important, well, on Earth, as they get better and better, they provide the most direct measurement of the geoid, which means you can use them to add details to satellite map, maps, to calibrate satellite maps. Um, and they provide an independent measurement from the other instruments out there, gravimeters, accelerometers, radiometers, which ideally would be combined with existing measurements to solve the generality problems and understand better what's underground. Um, and um, in terms of measuring um, relativistic effects around planets, the relativistic effects are large enough that space tra tra space spacecraft tracking, like what we do around Juno, is already sensitive to precession, to frame dragging. Uh, and while we measure some of these effects around the Earth, it will be interesting to see how they change as we measure them around planets, like the, like the gas giants or the sun. Um, and to see if we can if we can put any constraints or things like moment of inertia from this relativistic from frame dragging. Um, in terms of gravitational waves, um, general relativity is an amazing tool that teaches us about the universe through these gravitational wave detections. Um, we've already seen over 60 candidates from the first two runs, from the first three LIGO runs. So it's Right now, the last run saw one gravitational wave a week. Um, these are going to become daily events, so it's like every day you're going to get new information about the universe. And the scientists and as astrophys astrophysicists, we have to be prepared for this, um, um, to make the most out of this data. And we are bound to, found, to find more, more than what we expect, more than what that's what has been modeled. Um, so it's important to, to, to understand unmodeled sources, to understand what LIGO could see, um, what are the limitations of the models, of the data, to make the most out of these daily, um, um, daily events that we get from the universe. 
um, and uh, now this is like the end slide. This is sort of my life here right now with the goats and the concrete mixer. Um, but uh, any questions? So thank you very much, uh, Prof. Sanza. Uh, and now we go to questions. So please, um, let's, let's see. Uh, So can uh, okay, please. If anybody wants to ask some question, hi, dear Mark. I have a question. I'll, I'll put on please the video. Ahead. Yes, I'll put on the video also. I feel a bit sorry, uh, Alexandra. I've been talking into a sort of vacuum, no response to your jokes, and uh, I, I I really enjoyed your talk. I have a question about uh, what you said about the origin of the binary black holes. I, I forgot the slide number. It's somewhere halfway in your talk. You said that um, one of the reasons to believe that these binary black holes form in the galactic field is the fact that they have relatively low spin. And I was wondering whether you could say a few more things about that, because it, it's true indeed that the spin is relatively low, or apart from the, the one case that you, you also mentioned, where it's the primary was actually having quite a large spin. But what, what is it that uh, the spin tells us about the, the spin of the individual black holes? Um, what does it tell us about how they, how they form? Well, I guess the question is, can black holes lose spin? Okay. And right now in the astrophysics community, it's believed that it's hard to get rid of spin. There is no real way that they can lose the spin. So it means that if they have no spins, then they were born this way. Right. Right. So that if you if they are born from a merger, then it's expected that they would all 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 the, the final black holes acquire some spin in the mergers that we see, right? So if they are born from a from a merger, the question is where did the spin go? And right. So 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 de detecting no spin is not um uh, allowing us to distinguish whether the origin of these binaries is either field binaries or, or dynamically formed binaries, right? Oh, my connection seems to have broken. Sorry, Ruxandra. Uh, oh, I think the connection, something wrong with the connection with her. I, I can still hear you, Jordi, but I don't hear. Yes, I think Roxandra's connection is uh, something wrong with that. Okay, well, pity. If anybody has a, another question, you can write it in the chat. Maybe maybe she's able to reconnect. Ah, I think she now logged off. To Okay, unfortunately, uh, it looks like she has lost the connection. So we maybe wait for a minute to see if she's able to connect back or something. I have a wow. question in, in case she comes back. I can raise my hand, uh, my hand through the chat, but I don't know if you saw it. But let's wait uh, to see if she gets back. Yeah, I cannot see your raised hand. I don't know. Uh, if you go to the participant list, yes. Do you see a raised hand? Uh, now you lowered my raised hand. Really? Somebody <laughs> did that. You okay. See now? now it's up. Now it's down. Uh, hey. Okay, I can't see this. Now she's there, but without. Uh, Without sound, okay. Yeah, so my my, my ah, okay. Yeah, reacting up. It, it was pretty steady until we had this meeting, but now. Uh, 
if, if Jordi allows my video on. Oh, sorry. is it not allowed? You disallowed it or somebody. The, I, I don't know who's the host, but the host uh, killed my video. Oh, how do you like ah, that? Okay, here it is. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe the yak, yes. Yeah, I don't know who's. Uh, I, I, I had my video on when I began because sometimes people like to see uh, other people's faces while they're uh, speaking instead of just uh, their own slides and their own face. Uh, that, that was the, the reason. But I had it on and then, well, somebody censored my. I, I well, don't know how it worked. I, 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 I don't know who's, uh, who's hosting this. But uh, anyway. So, well, first of all, uh, thank you. Thank you, Ruxandra, for, uh, well, first for agreeing to give the talk, then for giving this talk, which is, uh, it was uh, really wide ranging, as I think uh, your interests are, and it was very comprehensive. So I think I, I mean, there were many things in the, in the talk and I didn't uh, take note of uh, all of them. But, uh, so I, I have some, uh, well, I, I will ask, a question that's a bit more specific, but then I will also want to ask uh, some questions which are a bit more generic. The question that's more specific is the one that I remember, there were many, but uh, at some point you said that these uh, boson stars, they are supported by uh, Heisenberg's uh, uncertainty, uncertainty principle, and I'm not sure whether that's the most, uh, I think I see what you mean, whether that's the most uh, accurate or appropriate uh, description, because this makes it look like the boson star is a an object which uh, is uh, with quantum properties up to what well, kilometer scale or larger, right? Yeah, it is, right? It's called gravitational atom, right? Well, but is it, uh, I mean, I think it's more like, a, I mean, the occupation number in a boson star is very large, the occupation number of, uh, so it's more a semi classical object, isn't it? I mean, the yeah, number of... Uh, it's basically, the, it's also the size of the star, right? Yes. I mean, it's just, uh, I mean, maybe I'm just quibbling. Maybe I'm just quibbling about the way that one, one describes uh, these things, but it's a bit more like a soliton. And a soliton is a semi-classical object where the fields are in a high occupation number. So that's uh, more classical and the quantum effects uh, and the wavelength Typical uh, quantum wavelength is uh, smaller. Yeah, it's, it's a uh, big object where you have both some quantum effects. You, you have the conservation yeah. of angular momentum, and you also have the, the sort of classical effective waveform, right? The field. So it's. Okay, I mean, it's just a way of, well, how one yeah, explains so the, the things. I mean, one can have different views. Also, you mentioned uh, when you were discussing with Mark whether uh, black holes can lose their spin. There's a mechanism for uh, that uh, could drive the black hole spin down. You know, uh, this, uh, I mean, this is, it depends on the existence of uh, light scalars, like uh, you might have if you have these boson stars, the super radiance, through super radiance, you can drive the spin down, right? Yes, 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 the super radiance. Is this something that, yeah, uh, but yeah, I mean, you did, I mean, you're aware of this, but uh, you didn't mention this in the reply, and I don't know how much it can affect the yeah, uh, yeah, there are, there, you know, there are a lot of papers on super radiance right now, um, and we don't have, yeah, there are no, we, we, yeah, we don't have the data to show that either it exists or it doesn't, right? So, yeah. <laughs> but how could it uh, affect this? I mean, you were saying that uh, I mean, one of the things that uh, I mean, there, there seems to be no mechanism within conventional physics or within right. conventional astrophysics to remove the spin. So, what would you make then if you observe uh, well black holes in a range of masses with very low spins? What would be the conclusions that you would uh, draw? Would yeah. it be more of an astrophysical conclusion or more a uh, say fundamental physics conclusion? Or well, it depends on uh, how would you distinguish between what uh, possible uh, mechanisms? Uh, See, I think it really helps to understand either you have very many sources and you sort of understand how they are distributed or you have um, perhaps more events uh, where you have them around quasars and stuff and you can see where they are. Um, it's hard, for me it's hard if you don't know where the signal comes from, you don't know what kind of galaxies it comes from, it's hard for me to draw conclusions. Yeah. Like you know, the, only, the only signal where we know where it actually comes from is the neutron star module, the first neutron star module. Everything else, we don't know what, what kind of environment it comes from. 
Yeah. A dance environment, is it a galaxy, or an old galaxy, a new galaxy? Um, um, so I think either you have many events, or you have, um, <laughs> or you know, or you have few and you know where they come from. Yeah. But could you distinguish between them, say, I mean, uh, depending on uh, what the mass range is or the, I mean, because there's, imagine that uh, you have that uh, black holes above some mass range and don't have uh, or have very little spins and below some mass range, the spins are, uh, are larger or vice versa. Nice. Are there, it could be a sign of dark matter, right? A sign that they somehow they can accrete dark matter, right? Above a certain... Uh, so, for example, if you have this, these ultra light particles, right, they can't be accreted by the black hole has to be large enough to accrete them, right? Because yeah. you have the, yeah, it's limited by the de Broglie wavelength. Yeah. So it, it would be interesting to see if black holes can somehow accrete dark matter yeah. uh, and grow, or if they can just accrete visible matter. Because right now the convention is that they just accrete visible matter, but if yeah. they're heavier than salt and can't come up with anything else, perhaps they can also accrete dark matter. Somehow it's, I mean, it's it's hard to think of dark matter as interacting only gravitational and hanging out only with dark matter to be more natural to mix with visible matter. At least for me. But then <laughs> it's less dark, dark, right? <laughs> that that makes it uh, less dark. Yeah, it would make it less dark. Yeah. Um, and you know, LIGO is sensitive just to mass, right? So we see the masses of you know. Um, so it, it can't tell whether it's visible or dark, yeah. but it gives you, if it gives you this larger masses, perhaps it means that there is some mixture of dark and visible matter, right? Um, it, it would be really interesting to see that. I, I have other questions, but there may be other people who want to ask, so I will ask them later in case there's, there's time for that. Thank you. Hey, any, anybody else uh, wants to ask some question? Sorry, I don't know if there's a mechanism to raise hand. I, I cannot find a way to figure out if somebody's raising hand or not. <laughs> I think if you go to the uh, participants uh, panel, I mean, yes, the list, yes, then you have a raise hand uh, button at the bottom. Okay. Ah, raise okay. hand, yeah, okay. Okay, I cannot see. Okay, let me, if there is no, nobody else, let me ask a question to you also. Sandra. So I wanted to ask about the, the mass gap that you mentioned. There is one object, I think you mentioned uh, GW190814, so one object in O3 that is basically suggesting that, uh, um, you know, there is an object that's between these uh, mass of, uh, we think, should be above the maximum mass of a neutron star, but uh, it has a low mass for a black hole compared to others we have observed. And I wanted to ask if this mass gap is so far only a theoretical idea that uh, people think there should be a mass gap, or if there is any real observational evidence that there is such a thing as a mass gap between neutron stars and black holes. Because I know that at least, uh, I know there is this model of a supernovae based by Doron Kushnir. <laughs> you, may, you may know, oh, sorry, um, yeah. I didn't have my video on. Uh, okay, so uh, I know that there is this model by Doran Kushnir where he um, uh, suggests that uh, supernovae type two are due to, are, are caused by some uh, oxygen burning, rapid oxygen burning uh, just, uh, just uh, before the collapse to neutron star. And then this would predict that there is no mass gap between neutron stars and black holes. Yeah, but observationally, again, just like we don't see these 20 to 40, to 40 solar mass uh, black holes, uh, we haven't seen any objects in the mass gap. That's why, <laughs> that's, why, that's why I think they call it the mass gap. But it's also, you know, they haven't seen any neutron stars. I mean, there are some that are about around two solar masses, if you look at the neutron star plot, right? They have, they have a figure with all the observed neutron stars. Um, but we haven't seen any others in the mass gap. Okay, but my question, my question is, uh, oh, well, there's some echo now. Um, so, so I'm, what I'm asking is, um, um, there is some 
if it could all be due to some observational selection or observational, uh, you know, bias, right? So uh, we know that uh, we, when we measure black holes, maybe there are some lower mass black holes and we're not finding them. Maybe there are, uh, there is a maximum neutron star mass possible. So it could be that neutron stars exist up to the maximum possible mass that, uh, you know, that they have before collapse and that black holes also exist down to this mass so that, uh, you know, core collapse of stars make all possible masses, and then there can be neutral stars or black holes, but there's no mass gap. And then, uh, so could it be just selection effects? Okay, we know that, for example, the X-ray binaries did not show any of these high mass black holes. So could it be all selection effect? Or, or do we have evidence that this mass gap is really very nearly empty? So there's this one object we found now from gravitational waves, but, but basically that there would be really a, uh, the distribution, right, would, would really have a dip there. Yeah, I mean, you know, I have on slide 19, I have all the neutron stars they have um, in the galaxies from X-ray observation. And basically everything that's high mass has a large error bar. Okay, uh, high mass is in, you know, there is one that could be bigger than two solar masses. They have large error bars. Um, and there are very few that are high mass. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, we, we, I think the answer is we don't know if, if, if it was believed that there was a mass gap, but we don't know for certain that there is one. This is the first object where we've measured the mass relatively well, and we know it's in that area that we saw in the mass gap area. Um, now, the others have larger bars, so they might or might not be there observationally. Now, from the astrophysics, um, yeah, it could be that there is a way that, that we don't, that supernovas are a messy environment. It's likely that we don't understand them all. So it could be that there is a mechanism to get these higher mass neutron stars. Um, but the question is, would they be stable? Like I saw that any neutron star about, above 2.2, 2.3 solar masses wasn't, wasn't stable. So are they stable enough to go around in binaries for a long time and eventually merge, I don't know. Um. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so I don't see any other question requests uh, and it's 13.10. Um, so maybe it is a, a good time to end this, as you know. I think the, that there's Valenti. There ah, Valenti. Sorry, Valenti. Yes, please. Uh, Valenti, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, it was just a comment. Um, I, my, my video is not working, I'm sorry. Uh, I think that, uh, I'm not sure um, Roxandra mentioned that during her talk, but uh, from X-ray binaries, the, you can see the, gas, the mass gap uh, because black holes typically have, uh, let's say, four or five solar masses or, or higher. I don't remember now very well how it looks like, but uh, indeed you have, let's say, between two and four solar masses, you have uh, empirically a mass gap from X-ray binary information. Yeah, 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 that's what I thought as well, that there was a mass gap. That's pretty, it has been pretty well established until now, now, you know, whether it was correct, whether it's actually there in nature, we don't know, but we haven't seen any objects other than this one. That's certainly the mass gap. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I think that uh, we're, we're going to, and I, I don't see any other raised hands if I'm not missing any here. Um, so uh, I think we're going to end here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this was a pleasure to hear you. Uh, so thanks very much for your seminar, Ruxandra. And uh, so hope to see you soon also. Uh, everyone else, uh, enjoy the summer. So thanks, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Have a nice summer. Thank you. Bye.